One thing you can always count on with the Japanese is their unique form of whimsy. It's a particularly unusual form of humour they have, which you might look at and think you've accidentally ended up watching a coked up Monty Python's Flying Circus. Japanese humour tends towards the surreal. It often makes no sense to foreign onlookers. So much so, in fact, that it can often find its way in front of foreign audiences by sheer virtue of the bizarre nature of what it's you're looking at. Joke, Chances are you're familiar with Takeshi's Castle, or Most Extreme Elimination Challenge, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on. If you looked at weird Japanese variety show clips on YouTube, you may have come across something like the Silent Library stuff on Downtown Nogaki no Tsukaya Arahende, and so on. When it comes to a more child-focused form of entertainment, though, it can sometimes seem indistinguishable from the stuff that you might see in that one Kyari Pamyu Pamyu music video from some time back, but it's much more noticeably childish than that sort of stuff. And because of that, one man came up with a concept for a game that would be a little more childlike in nature, and that reflects in the nature of this one guy in particular. From ideas he derived from a game played at a school sports day, came a game that's iconic for a variety of reasons, and we're about to delve into those reasons right now, with this review of Katamari Damasi. Katamari Damacy is a 2004 action puzzle game developed and published by Namco for the PlayStation 2. Its objective is very simple, roll a ball around to pick things up with it to become an even bigger ball. There isn't really much more I can add on to this immediately, I've already given you an elevator pitch for the game. Right now, however, we'll move on to talking about the man behind this game's concept, Keita Takahashi. Keita Takahashi graduated as a student in sculpting from Musashino Art University, with noble alumni such as Perfect Blue and Paprika director Satoshi Kon and Hello Kitty creator Yuko Shimizu. However, he didn't feel the desire to pursue it as a career, and instead went into video games for other artistic endeavours. He went to Namco and worked on a number of projects there before he would conceptualise a game based on two separate concepts with one of them being a demo called Densen by Sony Computer Entertainment. Incidentally, it was headed up by Kiyoshi Sakai, who is best known for creating Umihara Kawase. I need to cover this game at some point. Anyway, the other one was a school sports day game called Tamakorogashi, where the objective is to push a large ball, usually as big as a school child is tall, either a given distance of 10 or 20 meters or in smaller and smaller circles. When it came time to bring the idea to life, Takahashi had an idea of how to develop the game, and it was influenced by Namco having something similar to what Konami had, the Namco Digital Hollywood Game Laboratory, an institute designed to train future game developers. Konami had something similar, simply called the Konami Digital Entertainment School which worked on some unique concepts for games and their gameplay, with the principal example of their work being games released by Konami Games and Music Division, now Bimani. Mitsutoshi Ozaki, an old boss of Takahashi's, suggested to him that he make use of the laboratory and its students, who could work on the 3D assets for the game, whilst a prototype could be developed to see if the game had any legs. There was one problem, however, and it is tied to how the PlayStation 2 had been announced. The project had started around the time the PlayStation 2 specifications had been announced, and software development tools weren't made available for a while because Sony expected studios to figure the hardware out relatively quickly. This ultimately resulted in a number of games that launched on the system that sold the next generation short, and it wouldn't be until a year or two that the PlayStation 2 would come into its own. Despite this, Namco got on with developing the prototype for the game, which would be completed in roughly six months. Soon after, Namco's higher-ups gave the green light to make this a proper game, and would draft in Osaka-based Now Production to assist in the game's development. Takahashi had doubts that the partnership, separated by hundreds of miles, would work, but Namco assured him that it would work. The team of roughly 20 people would finish off the game in a year and a half following on from the prototype, and it would be done on a budget of 100 million yen. 
For contrast, Namco spent as much as 10 times that number on contemporary entries to the Ridge Racer and Soul Calibur series. The end result was a game that would release in early 2004, consistently placed in the top 10 for games sold for the first 9 weeks. And whilst Namco's prediction of half a million units sold wasn't met by year's end, indeed it only sold 155,000 units in Japan, its subsequent American release would fare surprisingly well, and it gave Namco the impetus to make more. Also spurring things on was the positive reception from reviewers. It consistently scored above 80% from most publications, praising the game's quirky and lively style and simplicity, although some criticism was drawn from the game's limited length and repetitive nature. So how were things in the end? Perhaps we should start looking into the game, especially now that I just recounted this game's development, so let's go have a look at the game's packaging real quick. The one thing I can say about this packaging is that it is perfectly representative of the game itself in a fair number of ways. It's a very colourful and cartoony box art, and all in all, it's really nice to look at. Quite apart from the focal point of a couple cows grazing on a nice verdant field, you've also got Mount Fuji, and a huge rainbow, and a whole bunch of guff just rolling around like a massive concrete tumbleweed in the middle of a city. I can't really think of anything particularly bad to say about this cover. It's a cool, clean cover that's really nice to look at, and it gets the idea of the game across. A massive ball of guff rolling around and getting bigger. If there's one thing I don't like about this cover, it's that I wish the logos at the bottom weren't as intrusive, but I suppose you have to have the rating on there just to tell you that indeed, the game is suitable for children. Pray tell why there are mushrooms there though. On the back we see the last remaining vestiges of Dutch culture on the field, as well as an array of six screenshots, all quite large and detailed. This is what I love to see, things that are properly readable and clear to the potential customer of what to expect. The text also gives you an explanation of what the game is about, though if you didn't already glean that from the images, then I'd be somewhat surprised, though I don't blame anyone for being confused at this game. Not much more to say about the back, so let's have a look inside. The usual accoutrements greet us within, with the game disc to the right and some papers on the left. Naturally, one of them is a survey card that we don't bother with, so let's have a look at the manual and realise one minor problem for us. It's landscape. Now, this isn't inherently a problem. For example, the manual for Okami was bound on the short edge in a similar way to how a scroll might be, and in that context it works. That's not to say there aren't things it works for in this manual, but it's annoying to try and present. This is a well laid out manual all the same. It makes extensive use of block colour in a very appealing way, although the contents do somewhat rely on you being able to read Japanese. It's not always very clear what you're meant to do, but you do get a decent enough impression of what to expect from much of the packaging, and that's really all you need. It also helps that the game itself is relatively simple, so with that, let's get around to playing it at long last. Upon booting up Katamari Damacy for the first time, you are greeted by a black screen, with some humming in the background. We quickly move on from that, however, and we are greeted by a cutscene that would not look out of place in a Beatles music video. It's weird, it's colourful, it's bombastic, it's almost celebratory, and it's absolutely absurd. Truly and honestly, this cutscene is infamous for how crazy it is, and it sets a tone for the game better than a lot of cutscenes in games. Anyway, we begin the game and it throws us into a tutorial of sorts. We are spoken to by the King of All Cosmos, we being his son, the Prince. He explains to you what you're doing exactly, and that is learning how to use a device known as a Katamari. Once he leaves you to try manoeuvring with it, you're given access to the controls. This is where Katamari Damacy differs from a lot of games and it's in its controls. The face buttons see virtually no use in normal gameplay. Instead, you're playing the game primarily with the analog sticks. Pushing a given direction on both sticks will move you in that direction with some speed. For example, if you push your sticks to half past 10, or northwest if you prefer, you will move forward and to the left. Also, pushing up on one stick will move you around the Katamari for you to redirect where you want to roll it. 
After a brief stop and some more yammering from the king, you get to see more things you can do with the controls. R1 allows the prince to jump into the air to observe the local surroundings, or you can press the L1 button to have a look from ground level. You can also rapidly and alternatingly move the sticks forwards and backwards to give yourself a massive boost forwards, which is useful for if you want to quickly get some momentum. Overall though, you end up finishing the tutorial, the king is impressed at what he sees, and you can get back to whatever you were doing. That is until a little bit later, when the king decides to go on a little bit of a drunken rampage, demolishing the stars in the night sky as well as Earth's moon. Every star was destroyed and the king messed up royally. Upon a side, the king, making an absolute dog's dinner of trying not to destroy everything, puts the task of remaking all the stars and the moon onto… you. The prince. Who had basically nothing to do with this. Now that we're tasked with being the king's own cleanup crew, he sends us down to earth with a mission and he gives us a katamari to roll and finish his tasks. Oh, to be royalty. Once the king puts you down on earth, he gives you a target and a time limit, how big your katamari must get, and how much time you have to get it to that size. With that in mind, let's get on with explaining the game and how it works. The objective of Katamari Damacy is to grow your katamari to a given size, but you might be wondering how you're meant to do that. Well, the easy answer to that is you have to roll your katamari onto objects in order to pick them up and stick them to the katamari. It's really quite a simple gameplay system in concept, which is funny considering how much difficulty I had trying to come up with a decent metaphor. Think of it like a snowball in some games, where the ball gets much bigger as it rolls down a large snowy mountain. With more and more objects on your katamari, it will grow in size and when the time is up, the king judges your katamari and turns it into a star. Or if you fail to make the target in time, the king will berate you for failing to clean up the mess that, if you need a reminder, he started. This game observes a fair few rules with what happens when your katamari touches a given thing and the momentum with which contact is made. Let's go over these rules real quick. An entity has to be a certain maximum size depending on your katamari's own size in order for you to pick it up, otherwise you will just bounce off and potentially lose a few entities from your katamari in the process. You'll generally start out with something small, meaning you'll only be able to pick up the littlest things first, like thumbtacks or caramel candies, before you'll be able to pick up something larger. There are a few other things to keep in mind. When you get bigger, you can end up with an oddly shaped katamari, something more elliptical than spherical. It can require some momentum for you to roll it smoothly if it's more egg shaped for example. Not only that, but it's also fairly easy to end up getting stuck because your katamari got big. There is an insurance policy with this, called shedding stuff from your katamari so that you can move again. But yeah, such is the nature of this game's physics. The array of items you can stick to your katamari will also change, including but not limited to and in order of increasing size, small animals, people, larger animals, vehicles and buildings. As you get bigger and bigger as well, the camera zooms out, showing you just how much you've grown. The feeling of getting increasingly bigger as you play a given level is just so gratifying. I'm going to liken this to one of those clicker games like Cookie Clicker, where you can get a higher and higher number to get that endorphin rush to your brain. There is one big difference however in that you don't get to roll over and collect literal skyscrapers in an idle game. There is a little bit of irony in this because Tap My Katamari was a clicker game that released for iOS and Android and was lambasted by basically everyone in the end. But that's for later on as there are a few other things we have to talk about, like this game's progression and, first off, the presentation. Perhaps the first thing you'll notice with the game is that it is exceptionally colourful. The game makes use of a somewhat simple yet bright and vibrant colour palette. The best thing about this game's colour palette, I think, is that it's bright enough to make the world feel very vibrant, but not so bright that it breaks its way into the entire game in an unwelcome manner. There is a balance that needs to be maintained about bright colours and contrast, and it's something this game does well by being colourful and vibrant, but not an overwhelming array of neon lights or McLaren MCL36 liveries. Another aspect of this game's visual presentation is the 3D work. 
This one's a little trickier to judge because Katamari Damacy doesn't use a traditional sort of art style, instead going for relatively basic geometric shapes. You can see this in particular with some animals and the humans, where they tend to be somewhat boxy in appearance, albeit somewhat smoothed out around the edges. It's quite distinct, and it gives everything a somewhat doll-like appearance. Most objects just tend to look somewhat like their real-world counterparts though, like the little shogi pieces, stationery or foliage. This isn't a bad thing by any means, since it does ground this world to some degree. It doesn't prevent the game and its world from being whimsical, but it does give you an idea of what the world is like by grounding it and filling it with regular items you may recognise. With that in mind, let's talk about the king of all cosmos. This dude right here is a mad lad. Not only did he drink one too many and play full bulldozer with the night sky, but he's just too fabulous. His physical appearance is based on Japanese ballet dancer Tetsuya Kumakawa, and to nobody's surprise, his personality is based on Freddie Mercury, complete with a speaking pattern that is flamboyant and campy. And he is implied to be able to speak in multiple languages, including Filipino, Arabic, Polish, and Esperanto. On that note, the text he speaks in is all in kanji and stylized katakana, which is amusing and absolutely a stylistic choice. That said, pretty much the whole game has basically only kanji and katakana, with only really a handful of situations where hiragana is used. The UI doesn't really feature any English anywhere, chiefly because Katamari Damacy is Japanese through and through. Despite that, the UI is pretty consistent and straightforward, and it doesn't provide much blow anywhere. One good example of where this game applies some degree of ease of playing is when your Katamari is obscured behind a large object. There will be a circle with the character for Katamari inside it, indicating where it is. It's very handy in that regard. And now onto the audio real quick. Katamari Damacy is a loud game, somewhat visually, but mostly sonically. So much so, in fact, that it was clipping my computer's line input, so I had to turn it down a tad. I'll begin with the sound effects first. The game's sound effects are very poppy and distinct, from the sound reminiscent of a bottle being uncorked, to the poppy sounds you get when you roll over an object to picking it up, it all sounds good. The voice acting for the King of All Cosmos is itself just the sounds of record scratches, which adjusts in speed and intensity based on whether he's being quiet and contemplative, or excited and urgent. It's certainly a novel approach to vocalisation. That said, there is actual voice acting in the form of cutscenes that feature the Hoshino family, consisting of a mother, father, son and daughter. These cutscenes appear every time you finish a mission successfully. This doesn't tend to sound like the sort of voice acting you'd hear in anime. It sounds more like an ordinary family than anything else. It's difficult to really explain how it sounds, since voice acting is not my forte, but it sounds fine and believable for what it is. Pretty much the rest of the game's voice acting can be boiled down to instances where you roll people up onto your Katamari. It gets all the more hilarious, however, when you start rolling up buildings with tons of people in them. The contrast between the poppy and generally bouncy music, and the absolute pandemonium in rolling big buildings up, is one of the most hilarious things I've ever experienced in a video game. And with that in mind, let's talk about the game's music, which is one of my favourite things to delve into with a given game usually, and this is no exception. If you are looking for an answer as to whether this game's music is good or not, I would be tempted to answer simply with, this game's soundtrack got a CD release. It's a bloody good soundtrack. This game's soundtrack features a huge number of performers, with vocalists consisting of Masayuki Tanaka, one of the vocalists for Crystal King, who performed the opening theme Aiyo Torimodose for Fist of the North Star. There's also Yui Asaka of Sukabandeka 3 fame, and Charlie Kose, a jazz performer famous for his work on the Lupin III franchise. Incidentally, Kosei performs the only fully English song on the soundtrack. Everything else is mostly Japanese, but if there's one thing that's great about the soundtrack, it's just how widely varied it is in terms of genre. It's a truly genre-fluid soundtrack. The game's main theme, Katamari on the Rocks, is the one track almost everyone knows about. This is the song Tanaka sang on, by the way. Imagine the sheer whiplash this fact gave me when I learned this. And it's so obscenely catchy that simply mentioning this track means it is now in your head. 
You're welcome. There are a few other tracks that I love in this soundtrack. Lonely Rolling Star is a nice, mostly chill song, whilst Gin and Tonic and Red Red Roses is a pretty jazzy track with some cool drumming and bass playing. Katamari Mambo is a lot more energetic though, but that just happens to be something I'm really into. All in all, this is a fantastic soundtrack. There's something for virtually everyone, and it stretches across numerous genres with many different styles, and it's absolutely something you can listen to away from the game. Hell, I was very tempted to pick up the vinyl print of the soundtrack some time back, when I saw it on sale at one of the games markets I tend to go to every now and again. Or at least did. I've only been to one of these markets since they started opening up again. I just want to go out and buy games again. Anyway, I mentioned I'd talk about this game's progression, so let's have a chat about it, because it determines how much you value this game in the long run. This game's sheer simplicity is both a strength and a weakness. Rolling things up to get bigger is a very simple and entertaining thing to do in this game, and the way the game instructs you is just great. However, there were a few criticisms that were said around the time, particularly that the variety of what you can do is somewhat limited. After all, pretty much all you do is roll a ball around to attach things to it. Criticisms were also levied at the game's length. I recorded three streams and my total game time totals to around four and a half hours, which is not very long at all. At the same time, however, I never really found it boring, because the nature of Katamari Damacy's progression enables it to maintain your attention a lot better than the reviewers of the time give credit. For each of the main missions you do, your Katamari gets bigger and bigger and bigger still. You go from rolling up shogi pieces, to rolling up animals, to eventually rolling up the very land upon which everything is situated. There is definitely some measure of satisfaction in seeing your journey progress from picking up the little things to rolling up meteorological events. It never stops being entertaining for me. There are also side missions focusing on creating particular constellations, where you are instructed to pick up particular things, such as girls and feminine things for the Virgo constellation, and unique pairs of entities for Gemini. There are also a few others where you have to pick up just one particular example of a thing to create a star, and it threw me off the moment I picked up a bear just to get Ursa Major. There is one challenge that really threw me off a bit, however and it's one that I didn't really get around to finishing, namely the one where you had to make Polaris. This is the most unique mission in the game, and the most obscure for that reason. The King specifies you that he wants a Katamari with a diameter of 10 meters. However, he also throws in a square button prompt, which sets doubts in my mind as to what I was meant to do. The moment I realised there was no actual counter for how much stuff I had, was the moment things clicked in place for me. This particular challenge is designed for you to get a feel for how big your Katamari is based on what you pick up, with the objective being that you have to judge the size of your Katamari as being 10 meters in diameter, and being too far above and below that means the king has your guts for garters. Spatial awareness has never been a strong suit for me, and whilst I did find a guide on how to judge roughly when you're at about 10 meters, I don't think it's the sort of thing I will want to pursue further. It doesn't sound particularly fun to me, but I do appreciate the attempt to provide more varied challenges all the same. And with that, it's time for me to wrap this review up. Assuming it wasn't apparent already, I quite enjoy Katamari Damacy. It's a fun, simple and inventive game that, despite not selling amazingly at first, did get a positive enough reception to result in yet more games, and it's great that it did. However, the only other game in this franchise to feature Keita Takahashi at the wheel was the following game, Wheel of Katamari, a self-referential title which makes light of how Katamari Damacy's reception resulted in the King of All Cosmos realising he has a massive fanbase all around the world now. After that, Takahashi went on to work on a few other games, such as Nobi Nobi Boy, Alphabet, and the apparently troubled Watam. His newest game, Kranken's Time Travel Adventures, is one of the premier titles for the Playdate console, making considerable use of the system's unique crank control. Katamari would continue on in his stead, however, as Namco needed to find a way to capitalise on something they had patented. Oh yeah, I should have said, Namco patented the gameplay system in Katamari Damacy, hence why there haven't been other renditions of it 
by even indie studios. They've patented a lot of gameplay systems over the years. With that said though, they have at least made an effort to put that patent to use, as the franchise saw numerous games for different consoles over the years, from Me and My Katamari for the PlayStation Portable, to Beautiful Katamari for the Xbox 360, to Katamari Forever for the PlayStation 3. From here on, however, things get shaky as the franchise shifts drastically towards portables and mobile devices, with games such as Touch My Katamari for the PlayStation Vita, and the aforementioned Tap My Katamari, which reviewed quite poorly in no small part due to its predatory microtransactions. Katamari Damacy would make its way back into people's minds almost 15 years after its initial release, however, with a port to the PC and Nintendo Switch in 2018, called Katamari Damacy Reroll, with eventual releases for PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Google Stadia. To be clear, when I wrote this script about nine months ago, Stadia was functioning, I suppose. The service is winding down now though, so just buy it on Switch or something. It was a very well received remake of the original game, and it also gave Europeans a chance to play the original, seeing as how Katamari Damacy never initially made it over here. Europe is a weird place. And now I need to go over a few things, such as importability and language requirements. There are a good number of Japanese copies floating about in the wild, indicated by how there are some PlayStation 2 the best copies out there. How much do you think they tend to go for on Yahoo auctions? Well, they tend to go somewhere between $1 and $5, or 100 yen to 500 yen. It's a very cheap game over there, so you might be wondering how much it costs over here. I paid £14. This was a few years ago, in fact it was one of the first PlayStation 2 imports that I bought, and the price hasn't changed a great deal since. I think the fact it didn't initially come to Europe made it more desirable, but still, there's a bit more of a premium, but it's not overly expensive. At this point, however, I may be tempted to suggest picking up Reroll instead. It's not particularly expensive, it's in 1080p, and it's available on any of the new platforms of your choice. Not Stadia though, that's basically dead or dying now. As for language requirements... I don't know if I would say that this game requires Japanese to be able to play it. There are situations where understanding Japanese would benefit you, but I don't think it would be a game changer. For the situation where I had to try and make Polaris, I didn't realise I had to create a Katamari that was as close to exactly 10 metres as possible. Though it does give you a few clues as to what you're meant to do for that. Dialogue is all in Japanese, but it's not particularly crucial to enjoying Katamari Damacy. You can play this game for the most part without it and not feel like you're missing anything. If this review is anything to go by, I think it's safe to say I enjoy this game and would recommend it to people quite gladly. Katamari Damacy is so simple and straightforward, it's practically foolproof. Just a shame Namco patented the gameplay system. And that is that for this review. If you have any suggestions of what I ought to cover, please let me know. I'm open to virtually anything provided I can get the game, and it's eligible for this series. My website, DanielLeomav.com, features my collection of imports as well as my wish list for games I want to pick up at some point. And there's also my Twitter for keeping up to date with everything that I'm up to. As ever though, this has been Daniel Leomav. City. Thank you.